Welcome to Conversations in Agriculture. My name is Conrad Weaver. I am your host. I'm a film producer and director and produce a couple of documentaries about agriculture. And tonight we are having a conversation with a farmer, grower, an amazing human being I'll introduce in just a minute. But our conversations here, we like to bring real farmers, real growers, real ranchers to our, uh, our Facebook page and now tonight also on Twitter to have these conversations to talk about farming and food and food production. And tonight, it is a privilege to have A.G. Kawamura with us. He's a third-generation fruit and vegetable grower and shipper from Orange County, California, and he's a former Secretary of California Department of Food and Agriculture. And he's also the co-chair of Solutions from the Land, a nonprofit organization that collaborates with farmers, ranchers, foresters, and stakeholders to implement climate-smart land management practices and strategies. AG, welcome to Conversations in Agriculture. Hi, good evening, Conrad. How are you doing? I'm good. It's been a few years since, well, actually, we had dinner, had lunch together just a couple of years ago. You were in D.C. for a meeting, and we got together and had a conversation there. That's right. And so it's, it's always great to connect with you. And uh, likewise, you and I, you and I first met a number of years ago when I was working on Thirsty Land, the documentary. And I came to, there to uh, Orange County and saw some of your work there in the city of Irvine and in the surrounding areas. And I was amazed by the work that you do there. So tell us a little bit about what, what you guys do at Orange County Produce. Well, we're, um, we're a company that uh, was founded by my grandfather and my father. Uh, in the LA area, and when I was a little after I was born, I was born in 1956. We moved into the Orange County area, and we were uh, vegetable producers at that time. And um, within a handful of years, by that was 1958. By 1961, we also were uh, involved in the strawberry industry, where there was quite a few uh, Japanese American strawberry growers in the region that were looking for a, a way to sell their strawberries other than just sending them down into the LA market. Uh, in the meantime, we were growing vegetables, uh, cabbage, celery, lettuce, and uh, summer vegetables, and had been able to find alliances with different chain stores. And so we were selling our products to the chain stores and those uh, Japanese-American growers of strawberries uh, with uh, uh, a very terrible marketplace over several years where there's just there was too much volume for that small market. They were looking for a place to send their strawberries uh, on a on a truck or in a train as the case might be at the time and it was the infant uh, starts uh, beginnings of that strawberry industry so we've been involved with vegetables and strawberries ever since and growing in an urban area today but back then orange county was a very rural area and so when people say i'm an urban farmer uh, i can truthfully say i farm in an urban area and maybe today it, it really looks like an urban agriculturalist because we farm on the most strangest pieces of ground, whether it's under power lines or on an abandoned airport uh, in between the runways or uh, uh, take over an abandoned golf course and, and try and farm on it. Uh, and we don't own the land that we farm on. So that's the other part about our, our, our company that's a little bit stranger or a little bit unique. Uh, and that's been for almost 30 something years. We've looked for properties within our region that we can farm on. And so uh, from a three or four acre vacant lot, uh, to a you know 50 acre 100 acre vacant field um, those are all viable places for us to farm I'll never forget when you we you took me to one place that was underneath these power lines and you had I think there were strawberries growing there and you told me that if you see weeds growing in an area you know you can probably grow crops there yeah that's the best rule of thumb if the <laughs> if the weeds are growing well you at least you know that the, if you can go find a water source you're probably going to have a pretty decent time uh, getting something else to grow yeah. What are I know back in uh, 2015 when we were there, uh, California was in the middle of a pretty significant drought. So what are the conditions there in Southern California now? Well, it, it, it a drought is so real in terms of some of the the toughest challenges a, a farmer can face. You know, I'm fortunate because we're we're irrigating with our our water supplies that we have access to, whereas so such a huge part of the world's global food supply is uh, rain-fed agriculture. And so if you get too much rain, that's not good. If you don't get enough rain uh, in a drought, you're in deep trouble. And yet even with our irrigated source, we, we source water from both potable municipal water, reclaimed water, uh, tertiary treated reclaimed water. We have well water. 
And even with those different sources of water, and I, I like to make a distinction that the ability to turn water on and off is, 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 is a, of great value to any fruit and vegetable grower, especially because you're, you know, you're trying to manipulate the plant lots of times and you want the plant sometimes to be starved a little bit of water or to make sure you can anticipate really hot weather, you can get it drenched and get the water out there ahead of time. But having that ability to turn water on and off is, is really an enormously important part of the success of the fruit and vegetable industry, that's for sure. And, and um, I know in my little world, this last uh, drought that we went through is, is really a, about a six year drought. Um, I experienced pretty much all the things that could happen. We had a, actually a well went dry on one of our fields right before a harvest. Uh, and we had no plan B and we mm. barely got uh, a, a, any harvest out of that field. Uh, I've had a field where um, the well was sucked dry by my neighbor who was putting a, using a lot of water and uh, that was years and years ago but not not in this drought but it was the same kind of experience where we were growing sweet corn and all of a sudden we had no water at at, a, at tasseling time hmm. which is a really critical point in the maturity of that cornfield mm -hmm. um, I definitely have well, also watched we had saltwater intrusion issues where we were farming and all of a sudden the well started to get uh, the water quality started to get saltier and saltier and this is just in this past several years and if we didn't have a couple other wells to turn to uh, in that same area where we were farming, we would have been in, uh, out, of, out of business basically and shut down. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, having water, uh, a reliable source of water here in California would be the plug of, uh, of every farmer, every agriculturalist in this state is to not focus on that infrastructure and build it out and anticipate that we're going to go through these challenges is one of the most difficult things that we have to deal with when that's when we're talking about uh, planning and long-term planning and the and the resiliency of a state's ag system so uh, and and yet we're living it all the time because as you know there's a tremendous fight for water uh, here mm -hmm. in California uh, almost all the time right so it, it, you're also the president of solutions for urban agriculture so describe what is urban agriculture to you what does that mean and why is it important well, Solutions for Urban Agriculture uh, is actually was originally called Orange County Harvest, and we made created a nonprofit in our region. Uh, but it was because it was starting around watching uh, a lot of leftover food being left in the fields, and uh, I'll always be very grateful of a, a small handful of community leaders that approached us um, with this Irvine Gleaning Task Force. Uh, uh, a woman that led that uh, that fight came and asked if we could, they could come into our fields. A bunch of citizens could come into our fields after harvest and glean a lot of the leftover produce that they could see in the fields. And of course, we said no immediately. Uh, we were terrified of the liability that would occur when uh, you know if you let kids in your uh, families into your fields and the kids get tomato steaks and start sword fighting and one kid pokes the other kid's eye out um, and s then they sue the farmer. Uh, stories like that were the nightmares that we had heard many a time and, we, and people were saying, don't let people in your fields. It's just you're asking for trouble. And yet so I remember it would be coming to kind of gather up leftover crops that were left in the field, uh, gleaning, uh, truly gleaning our fields after after harvest. And uh, to shorten that story, I just remember this one day we were harvesting cabbage. Um, after saying no to this, these citizens, um, but we were having, harvesting cabbage. We had a worm issue. We had a lot of worm holes and worm problems with a beautiful field of cabbage, and we we're throwing about half of the cabbage way on the uh, uh, on the ground. And I remember this is 33 years ago or so. And I remember calling them up and said, "Hey, I tell you what, you can't come into our fields, but if you bring as many boxes as you possibly can in bags, we'll stick instead of throwing the cabbage on the ground on inspection, we'll throw them into your." boxes and I think that day we gave them thousands uh, of pounds of cabbage and and that opened the door then for uh, work until uh, of this kind of work of using our number twos to get them into a good spot and then the good Samaritan, good Samaritan Act of 1987 I believe uh, is what, what where it triggered the fact that we could actually be free from liability in the act of a charity and it was at that point we started letting people into the fields and we would have hundreds uh, and at times even the thousands on a weekend come into our fields and do some gleaning. And then that opened the door. Uh, and when you're talking about what is urban agriculture, it's so many different things for uh, whatever you can think of, actually, in terms of you know creating a food supply within an urban area that can be designated for any number of places. And um, we started actually 
growing food for the food banks in our area uh, almost 25 years ago. I remember being there at the, the Great Orange Park that one day, and there was a huge, uh, I forget how many acres of cabbage, and there was a group of school kids there harvesting the cabbage for the food bank. And it was just a really cool experience to see that. And I know that's one of your project areas that where you were working on. Yeah, if you can believe this, 25 years ago, we had a project uh, where we were just starting to uh, pursue this idea of custom growing food for a food bank. We found a piece of property. Not This is not the, the one you saw at the uh, Orange County Great, Par Great Park of Orange County. This was uh, in Irvine, though, and it was just a vacant lot that was t destined to be a park uh, park uh, in a housing development, and, but it was next to the railroad tracks. And we asked the city in, in a formal uh, city council meeting, can we use this little piece of ground instead of a park? Why don't you let us use it for a farm to produce food for the food bank? And the city uh, uh, at that time said, no, you can't do that. It's not zoned for agriculture anymore, even though it used to be a farm field. It's destined to be uh, uh, part of the development of the area. And, and so we walked away from that city council meeting just so just, you know, sad and with mm. all of our friends and volunteers. But you know what? We came back about three months later when we uh, stepped in front of the same city council same people and we worked really hard behind the scenes to say that we have a plan we'd like to do an edible landscape it's not agriculture it's horticulture <laughs> and the city said okay and that was the the genesis of the incredible edible park uh, in irvine 1980 uh, uh god i think it was 19 early 19, 19 1990s actually when that happened mm -hmm. and um to this day it's still there as a citrus park that still supplies food to uh, the general food, food banks in the area. And in the meantime, we've moved on to several other projects, including the incredible edible farm at the Great Park and other renditions of that where we're really excited about custom growing food for the food bank. And mm. uh, in a, in a, maybe in a few minutes, if, you, if there's an opportunity, I'd, I'd love to tell you how that initial concept, uh, which makes a lot of sense, right, at, at, at this, these small scales, may be one of the most exciting things I think we've, uh, we've landed on or we've observed in this current pandemic for a true way to really address uh, some of the challenges of food insecurity and nutrition insecurity and, and hunger. It, there's some really neat things happening, if you will, the lemonade out of yeah. the lemon uh, sure. of, of the pandemic. You know, that is a, you know, the, the food deserts that I've heard about around the country. In fact, I was watching a video here recently. I think it was uh, Mike Rowe was in in the city of Indi uh, uh, Indianapolis, and they were working with a, a, a farmer there who was providing food and work with some urban friends of his that they started a, a little grocery store in an area that had no grocery store. And so those food deserts are quite significant around the country. And so how are food banks like what you are providing, how are they helping those food deserts and what, what, is, what is the impact on the communities? Well, all, all over the world, actually, and all over the country, too, um, that's exactly what you're starting to see is the recognition that a, a piece of ground, access to water, permission from a city or a school or some, uh, some entity that owns the land uh, can open the door for food production systems, whether it's on ground that's you know absolutely a beautiful ground that hasn't been farmed in a long time or ground that's a bit blighted, and so you have to go above ground with the raised beds and other kinds of uh, above ground kinds of agriculture. And the ability then to take a piece of, of property, uh, un unused, under underutilized piece of property, and turn it into a, a community asset or, or a business asset, as the case might be, is is what you see happening uh, in the peri-urban and the urban areas all over the place. Of course, we talk about rooftop farming, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and challenging, but all of these different kinds of ways to produce a crop um, are enhanced, I think, by the kind of toolbox that's available today compared to what we had uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, you know, I'm going into my 42nd season uh, as a, a har harvest harvestable seasons. And the things, the way we farm today, the things we've seen in a lifetime is just unbelievable how advanced or how quickly um, evolved uh, our ability to farm has become. And yet I, I recognize very clearly that lots of times the public doesn't quite see that kind of uh, evolution or that transformation that's taking place while we, while, you know, while we 
within each season, we, we uh, have a great toolbox starting to be developed that allows us to do different things. And so at this urban area and in this uh, ability to then to, to find uh, innovative collaborations, if you will, find unusual partners that uh, actually have much of the same kind of goals uh, to, uh, in their minds. That's kind of the hallmark of, uh, of the work I know that we're, we're doing as a group, many of us, in, in dealing with the sustainable development goals uh, from the United Nations. Uh, I wish the whole, our country, w would be aware of what the sustainable development goals are, and yet I think they will be very shortly as they get introduced to this concept that um, we can change the world significantly uh, because it's already changing. It's already in the in full stride, if you will, of uh, amazing developments that are not necessarily acknowledged or observed on the day to day. Because again, you're, you're you know we're all trying to get through our lives <laughs> lately, and now just trying to get COVID, right? <laughs> yeah, just get by day by day. But there really is some significant uh, progress being made in these different m multiple areas. And in urban agriculture, I'll, I'll be the first to say that we. We um, there's no reason, for example, there should be food deserts, uh, and I, I would predict that very shortly there won't be, because of not necessarily just because of the uh, pandemic, but because of this clear, eye-opening um, uh, uh, and sh I, uh, sad, I guess, realization that we have this tremendous capacity to end hunger uh, on a planet, but we don't choose, we don't have the will to make it happen. And maybe very quickly, we're going to not only find the will, but even an enhanced capacity to make it happen as we start to look at different alignment, I think, of, of goals. Uh, it, that's partly what uh, I know that we're, we're working hard on. Uh, if I can make a good example, uh, have you, ever, you, you, of course, are, are familiar with the FFA programs, Future sure. Farmers of America. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, the Future Farmers of America is the uh, group is one of the largest, uh, uh, in fact, it supposedly it's the largest youth organization in America right now, if you don't count the two scouting, the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts together. But, um, and almost every FFA chapter has a, a, a resource base at a high school. Right. And a good example is our, our local uh, food bank, our local farm bureau and our nonprofit. We've all banded together with other partners to work with a local chapter at Westminster High School, right off the 405 freeway in Southern mm -hmm. California. It's a beautiful amazing little six acre farm um, that is just like a gem in the middle of a, you know, an uncut gem, if you will, in the middle of uh, 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 Southern California. And there are students and there who are active and part of FFA there. They, they have a great little chapter there. And we've basically turned the, the whole uh, FFA chapter there and the farm property with the great support from the, not only the school district, but the, the, the school principal, but we've been able to change that uh, and, and, upgraded if you will and it is cranking out a ton of great produce right now going directly to the food bank hmm. wow so what has the impact of covid been in southern california and agriculture in general from your perspective well, i i think uh, of course the news has been able to cover some of the uh, enormous challenges for those of us with very highly perishable crops uh, or perishable products so uh, of course whether it's dairy, whether it's the meat industry, of course, fruit and vegetables. Um, during the original shutdown of the food service industry, um, it caught everybody by surprise. I, th I think when I was in Sacramento, Governor Schwarzenegger had done a great job of m pushing all of us to prepare for uh, even influenza H1N2. And we went through a a many, many tabletop exercises and drills and thinking processes of what would happen in a pandemic in our state and around across the country. And I will tell you, we never, ever thought for a second and planned for a complete shutdown of half of the food system, including schools, the school cafeterias, hospitality. We, it just wasn't one of the things we could envision, I guess, at the time. So now that this is no longer a drill, but this is the real deal, we all recognize that we are missing uh, a lot of good planning, plan B, plan C, uh, the ability to pivot and turn and take your food supply that's no longer needed in you know, 100 pound gallon bulk uh, containers and all the other kinds of things that you have for food service and turn that down and, and make them available for the average consumer in a one pound or two pound or half a pound, you know, little container of stuff. And, and this, this absolute uh, unprecedented shutdown of that part of the food system, you know, caught 
everybody by surprise and the inability to save that perishable product that was, you know, the cows don't stop producing, the strawberries don't stop ripening, the, the lettuce keeps on going, and, and you just saw thousands of acres uh, and th millions of pounds of product that just ha were thrown away in that w several weeks worth of, of disruption. Hmm. And yet, out of this disruption, I know a good exa great example is a friend of ours um, had called uh, hoping to ask and see, knowing that we were involved with food banks, if there was more way to get involved with the food banks. And he was one of those growers that was disking down uh, lettuce in his fields uh, down south in the, in the desert there at the time of the outbreak. And we, we all recognized that there might be a way to hopefully start to create a program. And that was the, uh, the USDA did a fabulous job of putting together, conceiving of, and putting that farm to family uh, box of varied parts of produce and then going out for proposals uh, and, and put that together in a very short amount of time. But as that program was being put together, um, I got another call from a friend out of Washington who was representing the Navajo Nation. And, you know, we talk about this pandemic and, and the, the challenges that, uh, that were put upon the back of the food industry, the food system that we have. And I, I think most people would recognize in the United States, you know, for the most part, uh, the United States, bulk of the people had inconvenience. They didn't get all the choices they wanted, but they never went hungry. But there were definitely pockets, food deserts and pockets and reservations and native peoples. Uh, uh, areas where the where there was absolute shortages of food, no food to be had, and emergency rations that were had to be put into place. Well, this call that came out of Washington was one of those calls that said, "We've got people, families that don't have anything to eat because the food system has shut down in their area. They're at the tail end of that food desert." Mm -hmm. And what I saw happen was just some of the most remarkable then. Uh, collaborations that you could imagine where before you knew it, they were putting in, uh, uh, instead of taking a whole trailer load of lettuce, they were breaking that down and putting heads of lettuce with carrots, with corn, with other things inside of a box, filling the box uh, of fresh produce now, not distressed produce, not stuff that was uh, uh, off, you know, sitting for days and days, but stuff coming right out of the fields, got it on the truck and they send it to uh, the Navajo Nation folks said, well, we don't need to wait for Washington to come up with the right mm -hmm. format or the right uh, protocol. Just we've got revenue. We've got uh, access to dollars to buy food. Can you just send us food? And so these boxes started going out and a semi would show up in the middle of the, one of the reservations on just some crossroad. And there'd be 50 pickup trucks waiting for the truck wow. to show up. They'd open the back, hand lo offload all those boxes and drive them straight into the houses. And mm. maybe the most amazing thing was some of the women that were receiving, the families that were receiving this produce, they'd never seen such fresh produce before. Because mm. they had always been at the tail end of this food distribution center wow. set system and not at the front end. Same thing with the food banks. These same boxes of 25, 20, 25 pound boxes of really fresh produce were going into the food banks now mm -hmm. and people are saying oh, they've never seen such fresh or tasted such fresh produce and you realize immediately even though for example that we've been doing small scale um, small scale uh, custom growing of food for food banks over m these many many years here's a model that can be replicated and put into play and no one needs to permission to do it it could just be done and maybe you have to be thankful for amazon or all the other just-in-time delivery systems that are out there now but mm -hmm. what we see is this great opportunity to uh, truly uh, address uh, nutrition insecurity food insecurity with mm -hmm. valuable products that a family can use and uh and and actually be recipients of some of the freshest best products uh, that you'll ever find on a planet because it's farm fresh. It really is. And it's right. farm to table then becomes farm to family is something that can happen. So we're hoping that these kinds of uh, really, really successful um, turn and pivot, pivot and turn um, solutions that have come up uh, can be replicated, can be extended, can be uh, suddenly brought back uh, into the strategic way that we're looking at these challenges we have. And uh, as much as you know, people say this is these these are tough times. These are really amazing, important times because it's making us rethink and re, re reshape our our imagination, if you will, about what's going on. Mm -hmm. What does that kind of uh, 
program do for a farmer's business plan? Well, you if know, you it think about it, to, it takes money to, you know, make a farm happen and grow crops. What does that do? Well, if you can think about this way, because it's the scalability of it, let's say uh, you have a food hub in a region uh, of an urban area that services uh, or, or receives produce from 30, 40 small farmers. Uh, by being able to consolidate all of that into a single place and then rapidly get it packed into a cooled, uh, because with fresh produce, you have to, you know, treat it correctly. You have to get the, the heat out of it and, and cool it down. But with that infrastructure in place, this kind of goes is the same with say dairy products or or other proteins but once you handle it correctly because we have tremendous laws about food safety these days that have to be followed but once you do that correctly and you can get that great variety into a box now that box can be delivered on any doorstep or on any church or at any place where other people can come and distribute it and, and it doesn't necessarily impact the rest of the food system it's just an augmentation of the efficiencies that exist within the food system that we have. Uh, I, I think where, where, where you see an excitement is if there's help, whether it's through uh, the SNAP program, whether it's through the WIC program, uh, for the dollars to help purchase these products at a cost where all those suppliers uh, are, are not asked to donate it or are not scrambling just to find enough uh, donated uh, contributions to be able to custom grow food bank. That's kind of our model was we would hope that we'd get enough contributions to custom grow food for the food banks. And then the food banks would pitch in a little bit of their, their donated dollars. But now you start to see that, wait a minute, there's maybe uh, what, same thing with school districts uh, and the enormous amount of resources they have for their cafeteria programs. There's a lot of different ways to suddenly look and see that um, uh, these innovative collaborations might uh, actually deliver more bang for the buck, kind of that one plus one equals three, um, you know, uh, surprise, if you will, mm -hmm. that there's a, uh, where there's the will, there's a way. And I think um, uh, that's certainly something we're very excited about uh, after all these years realizing that, wow, we were onto something good 30 years ago, but now even more so. Um, mm -hmm. here, here's some models that uh, can absolutely, uh, if you will, strike at the heart of hunger mm -hmm. and, and make a difference right now. It's not something we have to wait for. Mm -hmm. So looking, kind of taking the, the camera up to the 30,000 foot level, to get a broader picture of the world. Where are we at in agriculture? What are we doing globally to end hunger, to provide sustainable agriculture so that future generations have what we can enjoy today? I'd be the first to say that that concept of what is sustainable agriculture, um, we certainly recognize that the, the environmental footprint of agriculture has to continue to improve and become better, right? We recognize that the uh, viability of agriculture it, within the, the communities that it serves or within the, the communities where it exists is, is a part of whether it's rural or not is a part of the regional and local economy and then uh, those producers uh, the, the endangered species that we are these days I think we're it's down at one percent of the US population is it so you know basically every farmers feeds 99 people is that how it goes i don't know but um trying to keep farmers in business and trying to get a new generation of farmers is, is part of this goal globally and as you would know um in in africa you have what 70 65 70 percent of the population is engaged in agriculture and out of that 70 percent much of it is subsistence agriculture in fact most of it is subsistence agriculture but out of that 70 percent 70 percent or higher is are women that are the farmers, um, putting tools, uh, sustainable tools and, and different uh, infrastructure into play is really the highest purpose that any country trying to create its own uh, path forward and destiny forward is to try and create a resilient food system that it, that it can rely on. And so you have to start from the very basics. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to have worked um, in, in Sacramento as a state secretary of ag and I didn't appreciate I think the infrastructure that supports agriculture near as much until I got there and realized that there's a lot of people a lot of uh, pieces of this puzzle that allows agriculture to exist or, or makes agriculture's 
uh, uh, success or failure uh, enormously important. And, you know, as simple as roads, simple as uh, obviously water systems and sanitation and the infrastructure for pest uh, surveillance and, you know, pest exclusion, keeping bugs out, the bad bugs out of a state, all those different pieces of infrastructure uh, is what humanity, you know, the, the, the civilizations have learned over the hard, the hard way that you have to be able to, once it's one thing to grow food, you have to be able to get food from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. And in the developed countries where the bulk of the, pro, so much of the produce, they say uh, fresh produce, let's talk about the food uh, in the fr- pro- fresh produce is never makes it to the table because it's lost at harvest or it's last before you could get it cool enough or it's lost in route. Um, that's one thing here. We throw away a lot of food after it's on the table or after mm-hmm. it gets into our house, we throw a lot of away food. It's but like a third of the food I think that gets, that's sold, gets thrown away, something like that. That's uh, that's the number that everybody talks about. And so when you sh- shut down the food service industry during this mm-hmm. pandemic, all the food that was being produced, including all the food that was destined to be thrown away, mm-hmm. suddenly finds itself pushed into the fresh market, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the fresh, the, the chain store market. And now you had this glut, a uh, uh, huge supply of food, depressing prices, and suddenly growers that even had uh, plenty of orders that would be a good example our company we had orders but the marketplace had had basically collapsed in many ways for mm-hmm. different periods of time mm-hmm. until until it straightened out one way or another and at that time you were a lot of decisions were made should i plant more should i stop planning mm-hmm. should i what's going to happen next and um and in the meantime so, some of the prices for the consumers were going up but uh, yes. you, you growers weren't receiving that it was kind of getting lost in the middle there someplace well in that small window of time when you couldn't pivot and turn and put your hundred pound block of cheese into a one pound you know little package people were raiding the markets and cleaning out the shells and you didn't have the in that little pivot and turn time frame and it was really set only weeks but it seemed forever you, 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 the ability to then say oh okay we need new packages let's just stop that machine mm-hmm. and turn on the the, the spare machine that gives you the next <laughs> size package down, um, that plan B wasn't in place. Now, mm-hmm. going forward, if whatever kinds of crises we might have, there's, I think, a lot more planning for how do you become nimble mm-hmm. and, and, and re- more resilient in ability to address some kind of disruption. You might know this because you, you've talked to so many different producers, um, but those of us that are farmers, it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is, but we live with disruptions. It mm-hmm. might be a drought. It might be a foodborne illness when suddenly nobody wants to eat your product because of some salmonella or E. coli. And all of a sudden, you know, they say, oh, we're going to eat something else. And they don't buy your product anymore or disruption because of labor. Maybe there's uh, immigration. The, the labor market is tight and and suddenly there's no labor. And now with this pandemic, suddenly it's not so much that people aren't getting to the stores, but your crew becomes sick and can't harvest Mm -hmm. and these are the you know disruption is something that we deal with all the time and it's Mm -hmm. just more and more of a reason to know that um we we have to continue planning we have to Mm -hmm. continue to think through these processes and 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 understand that the more robust your toolbox and talking going back to sustainable food production Mm -hmm. over the planet you know as we approach eight billion people it's just it's it's a it's a large task to feed everybody Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's no what, guarantee we're going to be successful. What does my behavior as a consumer or how does my behavior as a consumer impact how and what you do as a grower, as a farmer? Well, we take the signal from what you buy uh, and try and make more of it so that hopefully more people are, you know, the, the, the demand curve is going up on the product that you produce and maybe the product that you used to produce, it, it, they don't like it in one way. You know, I always look at the baby carrot market, remember? Mm-hmm. We used to, those of us kids, you know, you, we were buying great big carrots and you'd, you'd chew on a carrot for a long time. But then also these baby carrots show up in packages and they were basically originally some of the throwaway carrots, right? Mm-hmm. That didn't make the grade. But um, the consumer drives so much of what happens in our fields. If people don't want to eat... Um, you know, Brussels sprouts for, you know, 40 years and all of a sudden they like Brussels sprouts and now there's not enough of them. Guess what? We, we, we plant a bunch of Brussels sprouts. Or, uh, so in so, Southern you know, California, look at, did you grow a lot of kale? Because I think kale was like the... the there's a... <laughs> there's 
that was the best example of, of how, has your curl, this would be the way you would ask that question. Um, has your kale consumption gone up by 1%, 10%, 100%, 1,000%, 10,000%? Seriously, right? Because yeah. 100% would just mean instead of eating it, never you eat it once, right? Right. Yeah. If you eat it 10 times mm -hmm. in a year, oh, okay, now you've gone up 1,000%, right? Mm -hmm. When you didn't eat it before, you just right. left it. And now if you eat it 100 days out of the year, oh, guess what? You just had a 10,000% increase in your – I think those are the numbers, but – uh, yeah. Those kinds of drivers from the consumer for salads, for um, the newest fruit from uh, whether it's imported or that, a fruit that can be grown here, uh, we're always looking for great new products that we can put out there. Um, I, I had a field of fava beans. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to harvest this year. Uh, but as you know, fava, people are eating fava beans uh, mm -hmm. in different ways. I'm not familiar with whole, that, with, with a fava bean. It's just it's that. a... It can be made, it's similar to like a, a garbanzo in many ways, okay. but it's got all kinds of good, good things about it. But, um, but these are the kinds of things that um, we, we, we are blessed because of the choices. You know, this idea that there's a lot of waste in our economy, I, I get that. Um, and I get that there's a lot of waste partly because we do have so many choices and as opposed to a system of scarcity you wouldn't have as much waste because people would be, you know, they wouldn't waste it mm -hmm. if we lived in a world of scarcity like so many places on the planet. But because we do live in a, a world with so much, um, so many choices, I, you have to ask the question and a lot of people don't want to answer it. Uh, they want to say that something's wrong with agriculture because it just produces waste and it produces, you know, these, these challenges. And I, I, I always want to say, just the opposite you, you know you, if you had your uh, your druthers would you rather have a world of scarcity or would you rather live in a world of abundance if you would rather have a world of abundance um does that mean having a lot of choices is the right thing um then the argument to that is well how come everybody doesn't have the same choices and, and that's yet a problem for the willpower of a society to make sure then that everybody does have access to the the choices that exist and, it, and you talk then about an equitable food market and, you know, whether you wait for the governor, government to create that or you go out and create it yourself through these collaborations, that's kind of the, the place we're in right now is don't wait for the government to end hunger on the planet. I, I think it's fully within our grasp to rethink how we what, what are we are trying to accomplish with all the different partners from the health service arena from the um labor arena from the you know certainly departments of agriculture certainly departments of of, of uh, commerce um but there's just reasons why you want a healthy thriving uh citizenry that is eating great food and not getting sick right mm -hmm. That's and what how, always how, how can we do about that? always amazes me about farmers and people who are farmers and ranchers that they're looking ahead, they're, they're innovating, they're, they're doing everything they can to grow more food, better food, be more productive and, and, you know, find those solutions that will answer some of those questions that, that, that you're working on. And so, um, so what are some of those solutions that progressive farmers and farmers that are doing it right what are they working on to solve some of these global issues? Well, our, our group, which is called Solutions from the Land, uh, it's our national group. I, I think it was, for us, uh, an important moment. I mentioned earlier the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals that the United Nations came out with in the year 2015. And all the nations on the planet said, oh, those are good goals. Let's see if we can make them happen by the year 2030. And you look at the goals and there's seven, eight, nine nine of them that have a lot to do with agriculture and, and you realize that well you can't accomplish the goals if agriculture is not doing reasonably well uh, if not thriving in, in fact if you can't make that part of those the goals uh, thrive um a achieving the whole package which changes the way this world would is or the way we've ever envisioned it to be um it it, it begs the begs the how can i say it begs the question well, we better do something about making sure that you have successful agriculture on the planet. And I say that all the time. Successful agriculture is the backbone of successful mm -hmm. civilizations. You, sure. you, you find agriculture failing in any civilization uh, anywhere in time, and 
you've got problems. So yeah. if, if we can then start, stop the fighting about what kind of food you should eat or what kind of, you know, what kind of system you have, but recognize that everything we do needs to be moving towards sustainability. So that includes don't waste things, don't waste water. Uh, if you're wasting food, well, turn it into something of value, whether it's compost or other kind of feed or, or other kind of uh, uh, fertilizers or energy, as the case might be. You have the ability to deal with um, uh, the collaborate, collaborative nature of if you have energy and clean water and, and, and uh, the minerals to grow things, you can grow things in a lot of places, uh, whether it's up on the uh, space station or, or under uh, underground or any place in the world. But... Um, we're looking at this a newer dimension, if you will, of what's possible for agriculture. We're in a renaissance that is well underway, but it's not well understood maybe today. But um, the most successful system in a, in a small farm, in a small community in this country can be thriving uh, using uh, biodynamics or, or uh, organics, purely organics or all kinds of things, uh, as long as the support is there with the, the consumer that wants them to be successful. And, and then it goes from there all the way up to the largest system that you, you hope is in place. Because at any point in time, that small farmer or that big giant uh, ag business any one of them can have a complete collapse because of uh, disruption of, uh, again, it might be an earthquake, it might be a pandemic, it might be uh, a, a extended horrific drought, it might be a hurricane. All of those things happen, they are happening, and you better hope that if your system goes down, that your neighbor across the road or down the other state or in the other nation has created enough of a surplus to help offset these kind of predictable losses that we all see. And, and so what I understand is that we're trying to understand where those vulnerabilities are in predictable uh, disruption. How do we start to get ahead of those? I mentioned earlier, creating water infrastructure for a state that goes through dra periodic droughts. Uh, we, we know that we want to uh, not be ruining the soil. Right now, there's a tremendous excitement around soil health and the ability to sequester carbon uh, and, and to make the living organism of your, of your which is your soil, much more uh, fertile, much more active uh, in how it interacts with your plants. And, and n all of that is, is really accelerating. It's been known forever that those were things you wanted to do with your soil, but it's only really in recent times that we're starting to understand through the science of biology and the soil biology of, of just, you know, how do you get a billion microbes in the teaspoon of, uh, of good, healthy soil? Um, well, they've always been there, but we just never really knew they were there, I guess. And now we're trying really hard to understand how do we keep them there because ultimately they can enhance so much of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the use of minerals, the use of resources, all of all of these challenges are, are not for the farmer. It's for everybody that eats. You know, that's what I think is the hardest thing that uh, everybody that eats is a stakeholder in hmm. an agricultural outcome. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I understand that if we had, if we're doing a good job and we're creating tremendous abundance, no, no one's really thinking too much ab about the success of agriculture. Uh, I think many of us were kind of uh, amused is not the good word, really, but um, at, at when the shelves started to become empty during the rush on food, you know, the mm -hmm. panic in the stores, and all of a sudden shelves are empty and people are starting to panic about their food supply. Mm -hmm. It's the first time in 80, since the Great Depression, that you had, you know, actually commentaries on the television saying, what's happening? Are we running out of food? Are, 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 are we, are, are, is this, uh, you know, is this the beginning of the end? But Conrad, I want to make sure I can say one thing. There's an enormous crisis right now after this pandemic crisis, and that crisis is taking place right now on the planet where there's a tremendous shortage of food uh, because of caused partly by this disruption with the pandemic. And those systems that don't have resiliency, those systems that's, that don't even have a plan B or plan C or any kind of backup, don't have the infrastructure in place. And that, of course, is in whether it's in, in Africa or, or parts of uh, India and other areas. Um, and, and that crisis is unfortunately escalating. 
uh, as we speak, there's a tremendous locust plague that no one in this country even has any clue what's going on, but it's taken out a tremendous part of the food supply uh, of a large, large swaths of, of, uh, of uh, underdeveloped Africa, mm-hmm. uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And all of this is taking place when we have more access to information and ability to show what's going on in the planetary way than ever before. And yet it doesn't make the, you know, makes a blip on, on someone's nightly news. So and you think that's understood. It just doesn't impact us directly. I mean, yeah, but understand, we can understand mm-hmm. that, but it's not that we have to bemoan that as much as, okay, so what are we going to do here in 2020? And what are we going to uh, allow to happen when we know that we have tremendous uh, ability to pivot and turn and, and maybe change the way that we look at the, the challenges for other people on the planet, the challenges for uh, entire populations that suddenly found themselves in such scarcity that it's impacting the future health of their kids because the kids day after day aren't getting enough to eat. So here's here's our, our, our opportunity, I think, as, as a 21st century uh, civilization that's never existed before because it's after all early in the 21st century um, maybe we'll we'll find the willpower to deal with the capacity that we've created and this uh, amazing ability then to for example uh, bring those sustainable development goals into reality uh, ahead of time not not waiting for 2030 not cause saying that this pandemic is going to slow it up or, or make it hard to accomplish those things. It might make us more determined to actually make them happen, mm-hmm. especially many of the goals that are on that list. So I do would encourage you know your your. I'm going to guess that most all of, of your 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 um, viewers have already heard of the sustainable development goals, and if they have, please spread that word that we're working hard to see that by the year 2030, this this world could be forever changed, yeah, for the what, better. What percentage of Growers, farmers, ranchers need to buy into those goals to make it work. I think all of us that are producers, if we look at the goals, we would understand in a second that the goals speak to us and allow us to talk about the agricultural endeavor from the point of view of we're a part of you know humanity's effort to create. Uh, resilience uh, to to not survive but to live and, and if we can see that that there's a there's a frame support for water for infrastructure for transportation for energy for markets for the things that we need to be able to just keep producing food but not say it that way that it's all about me and my big business or all me and my small business or me and my my one commodity that no one, you know, really likes, but you want to pretend people like it a lot because it costs so much, you know, um, I'm being kind of snide on that, but there's just, you know, it's amazing how people love to buy, uh, um, love to, love to love, love, love their food so much. They're passionate about, they fight about it. They love their food a certain way and they're willing to, you know, get into fights basically about, my way or your way of production, your, these different means of production. And as much as I'm excited that people are passionate about food and the way it is presented or, or not presented as the case might be, we just have some more fundamental things that we're still in the process of putting together, uh, building blocks, if you will, of a, of a, of a better world. And, and being a part of that, letting the, our ag industry uh, really embrace the those, you know, those footsteps that have to be filled. I mean, you know, we've been tremendously blessed to have all of our ancestors that got us to here. Um, I, I, I say this all the time. I think I've, you and I have talked about this. My friend who's 95 years old this year, born in 1925, he remembers the names of his horses that used to plow his fields when he was a young kid as a 14, 15 year old kid, you know, and he remembers uh, uh, so many things in his in his lifetime. It, 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 he was born in 1925. In 1927, the global census said there were two billion people on the planet. Hmm. Well, we're just about at eight billion today. And in one man's lifetime, we've gone from can you imagine two billion wow. people and horsepower uh, to eight billion people, just about, and um, you know. Uh, all kinds of different kinds of energy systems uh, that are about to be unleashed and, and, and 
utilize that uh, are not necessarily fossil fuels, but even within the fossil fuel times of things, um, he, he was at a time before there was really tractors, uh, you know, early tractors is what he knows. Can you imagine in a single lifetime, that's what we're dealing with. And yet people are so, people are so impatient right. um, about, you know. And then it's amazing uh, you see these images from, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and other places where they're using an oxen to turn over the dirt to plant a, you plant a row of corn or maize, you know. It's, it's yeah. just amazing. That's but the ox works if that's all you got, right? Right, right. You know, I, I, the I'm system. reading a book right now about uh, by uh, Belinda Bauman is totally unrelated, but she, but she talks about empathy, and she spent a lot of time in the Congo, and talking with women who, again, women in Africa who are farmers who have have goats, and these women were you know chased out of their fields by the rebels, and they had to leave all the and they were mourning the loss of all their goats. Because that was their mm. life. That was everything to them. You know, it was just it really, mm. really made you think about, you know, what we have and the and the blessings that we have in this country, even in a in a in a pandemic. You know, we still have, we haven't lost all of our goats. You know, we haven't lost everything. You know, we can still go to the grocery store and and find things and and have food to eat and and mostly you know healthy things to eat. So. That that goat is a part of social secu- their social security, right? It, yeah. it's, you can take it, the drought might happen, in, but you can take that goat with you as you flee a, a area that's blighted. Um, yeah. uh, you know these the, the 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 lessons from our past. Um, we 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 have to uh, we have to be able to have a memory uh, of just how th- bad things can get and just how mm-hmm. tough things are. Um, that helps inform, I think, uh, you know, wh- wh- why we're on a path right now. Obviously, enough has been going right within our food systems to go from 2 billion to 8 billion people, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've had enough success over this 100 years, let's say, 90, actually, it's only 90 something years, right? But mm-hmm. Enough success to feed enough people to build that kind of a population over that short amount of time for the first time in the history of a planet. And, and can we sustain that? Uh, some people would say no. Uh, some people would say, "Oh my God, we you know we we must do something different." And, and the different that I see is is um, get better uh, in every category of how we go about doing things. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and, a lot of a lot of things to think about and a lot of things to work on. So yeah, what what sure are you is. what are you working on? Well. In our own farm uh, operations, um, we've been just excited to have access to some new tools. I know we've been this year within our strawberry growing group and our, our vegetable growing group, we've had access to some new bio predators uh, that we hope can replace some of the molecular biology of, of chemistry, uh, pesticides, if you will, that um, we see out there. But at the same time, um, I'll always say that I, if I need to go to reach to the medicine cabinet to go get a stronger tool to save my crop, the the, the saddest thing is when you lose your crop uh, to a bunch of uh, uh, you know disease or or insects or I, I actually this this year I've lost a, a little corner of one of my field yet again to a bunch of rabbits, <laughs> um, and I guess maybe I should be happy I'm feeding the rabbits because we also have one of the largest populations of red-tailed hawks in the in the world, <laughs> uh, the place I farm. <laughs> so I guess we're feeding the rabbits to feed the hawks, but it's still chain, not, right? <laughs> it's not, not what I really want to see happen. Right. But we, we're, so we're experimenting constantly with new tools that way. We've got some uh, irrigation tools to help us see if we can even save more, uh, even though we're drip irrigation entirely. Some of the new monitoring tools that you have allow you to really spot, uh, create a precision ag kind of delivery system both for the water and your and your uh, and your uh, fertilizers, um, there's a couple products we're eager to try, which are colonizers for your root system to kind of enhance the activity surrounding your roots to see if they can get uh, actually uh, more interaction with the with the soil organisms and the other things, the uh, other uh, minerals that exist, and, and a better translocation if you have minerals into the plant, which then means that we might be able to save as much as 20, 30% of our fertilizers. Hmm. Um, 
on, on ground and we were excited to see some of the results that are out there. Um, there are uh, new new tools that um, I, I'm just working with some friends that uh, have some brand new ways to basically pulverize everything from corn to uh, mineral rocks through sound waves and they're up uh, up and going with some new a new technology that is is remarkable uh, and it's so far it's proving that it's just a new way to do things without heat uh, can you imagine uh, pulverizing corn kernels into uh, flour or to, into well really really fine um, flour if you will hmm. And for all the different uses there, but it's not just that. It could be anything. It can be even your um, your wet compost. Uh, they th put it through us a, uh, uh, um, a sonic um, chamber, an accelerated chamber, and 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 it's 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 hard to describe, but it's pretty pretty uh, pretty fascinating and out there. But um, clear clearly, um, some of the you know they say the the future is here. It's already happening. We have a we have a friend that has a wonderful way of using these um, greenhouse rooms uh, that are so smart that they use about forty percent less energy than the current greenhouses that are out there forty to sixty percent less energy wow. to maintain a temperature a stat a, a perfect temperature uh, in fact that that company that one time they were thinking of using these greenhouses for rooms for the the uh, the pandemic patients that need to be in intubated for their lungs and you could have a negative atmosphere in a room where the, 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 the cross contamination wouldn't happen and the humidity is right for that and the temperature right is for that patient. And then when they're done with it, they could put these uh, hot houses, these greenhouses up all over the place. Mm. When they're done with it, they could sterilize it and then start doing food production mm. as part of an infrastructure of a city. Wow. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that uh, I get pretty excited about all the time is uh, we, we, we talk about a robust dynamic toolbox and it's just filling up with so many neat things that uh, need to be tried out and need to be tested and need to be put into play. Mm -hmm. um, I know in our own company we're uh, sadly in a way moving more towards mechanical harvest mm -hmm. uh, for our green beans um, and uh, as much as I don't necessarily want to do that uh, partly because I, I, uh, I'm dependent on wonderful, incredible labor. Um, our labor costs and our challenges here in California have been pretty high, and we compete directly against Mexico with the products that we grow. And uh, I've become, in many cases, sometimes the high-cost producer of different products. Mm. And I'm not. Uh, maybe we have to become better marketers so we can market that high-cost product. But in a, you know, you know crop against crop uh, comparison, a lot of times the crop that's coming on Mexico is fantastic too. It's not that it's better or worse. It's just um, produced with a lot less dollars invested in it. So specifically in labor, and that's a challenge then that, um, uh, that we're the rea it's a reality check for us of whether we can stay in business or if we need to try and alter our, 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 the way we, what we're doing in our urban area. Uh, I, if I can give you a quick, uh, uh, testimonial about a friend of mine. Um, right after the pandemic broke out, my, uh, one of my friends who's the last, one of the last standing cattlemen in Orange County, um, he basically said, I remember because they shut down the farmers markets, and he said, I think I'm going to go out of business. This is it because he's been selling his products mostly through farmers markets for the last 20 something years. And he says, this is it. And I, I called him back about three weeks later after the stores had shut down and all the food was flying off the shelf. And, and he, I go, hey, how are you doing? The, uh, anticipating him, you know, to be very glum. And he says, you know, I just sold meat, more meat in the one couple of days than I've done in three months in a row. Uh, and all of a sudden, everybody seemed to remember that he had meat, mm. uh, fresh beef, uh, grass-fed beef, uh, and they were buying whole sides of beef off of him and now he's sold out into the whole rest of the year and he's never had a better year um and another my friend who has roadside stands same thing he says my god it's just unbelievable how suddenly people didn't want to go to stores and they showed up at his roadside stand where they could run in grab stuff and boom they're out the door and mm. he's had a having the best year of his life and um i know our farmers market that we help manage through our our, our solutions for urban egg we were 
one of the very first uh, in the country, I think, to have a drive-through farmer's market, mm -hmm. partly because the city of Irvine was willing to support us and recognize that it was a part of, you know, essential resources that the city needed. And so they, we found a way, uh, again, to, uh, to defy the odds, but to make something work. And I guess that's the whole point where there's a will, there's a way, right? Yeah. And yeah. there's where there's an imagination that, that goes with that will. Right. That, that's part of this. And, and there's nothing like a, a challenge, a hardship to create innovation and, you know, people doing new, trying new things to make things happen. And yeah. sometimes and we I, get, amen. I think, I think sometimes in the easy times we get too complacent and we're like, everything's going great. We're just going to keep it as it is, you know, and then, you know, and, but, but, then, but then, but then there's not as much innovation. There's not as much, uh, you know, new ideas coming out of that. But when you have some hardship, uh, that, that produces, you know, all kinds of new ideas. And I know in my business, I'm doing this, program tonight as a result of the, the pandemic I, okay i need to pivot try to do some new things try to create some new interest and so i thought you know let's start this program let's start you know interviewing farmers and growers and ranchers from around the world and and so this is what i'm doing as a way of innovating and and uh also for me reaching back and and to my roots my agriculture roots and and saying, you know what, I love farmers. I, I love what farmers are doing. Let's let's tell their story. And so, that was kind of my my pivot, I guess, so to speak, is to go back and doing these kind of things. Well, I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity to share some thoughts. And thanks for all, all that you do to help uh, really put put a light on you know the great stuff that's being done and is happening. This agricultural this agricultural renaissance is not a it's not a fluke. It's it's going on. It's it's just yeah. amazing what's happening. Yeah. Well, I do really appreciate you being, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule to, to talk to me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and to, to hang out and to, uh, to learn. Uh, you have a lot to teach us. And so, uh, well, do, do come and visit us anytime out here. We're, we're, we're here, but, uh, this pandemic might make it a little bit of time, which yeah. just means we'll be up to more stuff. Uh, sure, I, sure. I, I'll finish by saying, all of us, you know, don't don't let us get caught up being in a think tank. It's time for us to be in a do tank and do things. We, we, yeah. we can get stuff done and we really can um, make that difference. And please do look at those sustainable development goals as a part of, you know, where the change has to come and where we're headed. So thanks, right. Conrad, so much. Sure. Thank you. If you hang on just a second, I'm going to wrap up a few things and announce a few things coming up in the future. Next week, we have Eric Sanarud with us. He grows hops. If you like beer, if you drink beer, if you think that uh, if you want to learn more about hops and what that's all about, join us for Conversations in Agriculture next week at 8 p.m. And then coming up on in August, August the 10th, we have Michelle Miller, also known as the Farm Babe. She is one of the has one of the largest social media followings in the world and she is a farmer and we're going to hear all about her story coming up on monday night uh, 8 p.m on august 10th tonight we have had the privilege of having ag kawamura with us ag thank you for being here on conversations in agriculture great thanks and thank you for thanks, watching Conrad. yeah thank you for watching everyone stay safe yep and we will uh, see you again soon.